we're going to get started off with uh, Robert Workman. And um, we'll be talking about do a quick intro and then um, SPS. So uh, take it away, Robert, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get the screen shared here. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Um, there we go. I think you guys can see that now. So um, I just want to say good morning to everybody. I know um, we're, we're just uh, starting to get um, uh, attendees in and, and uh, uh, definitely want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy days to uh, join us here today. Um, we should have a, a pretty interesting uh, next 45, 50 minutes uh, to talk about cybersecurity. And uh, as the attendees come in, you know, uh, uh, cybersecurity is, is obviously maybe something that, that is something you're, you're just starting to go down that path to discuss or, or, or something that may not be uh, really um, uh, something that, that's in your uh, view as of yet. Um, a lot of uh, the companies and attendees involved here today have, uh, have worked with their manufacturing environments and their industrial environments to, um, to really handle a lot of the traditional issues that affect machine uh, uptime or, or really the, the influence of, of downtime and what you're trying to do to minimize machine downtime. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of those traditional issues uh, go back to, to availability of parts or, or availability of uh, do preventive maintenance, maintenance on your controllers, on your motors, uh, on your machines and on your mechanics. Uh, a lot of the traditional aspects of what we consider uh, uh, influencers on OEE and, and machine uptime. Uh, but as the uh, manufacturing floor of, of tomorrow gets implemented in terms of controllers and other devices being networked, uh, we now introduce another aspect of, of machine uh, uptime or possible downtime causes, which, uh, which really come in the form of remote hacks and, and, and uh, potentially um, uh, even uh, even more worse, there's potential contractors on site that are just trying to link into your network and, and, and uh, accidentally uh, uh, put in viruses or potentially other aspects that, uh, that can compromise your own internal uh, network there and, and, and potentially bring your systems down. And so cybersecurity is, is, is really, uh, uh, to us, a, a manufacturing issue and something that, that we need to be concerned about when we take a look at, at the solutions that we provide to you. So again, as, as, a, as a, a customers of Buckle Smith and Allied Electric for a number of years, you've, you've come to know us as, as a source and provider to you of industrial automation equipment, electrical equipment, and we'll continue to be that. But we really want to continue to, to, to work with you as, as the smart manufacturing 4.0 environment continues to expand and, and networks are implemented now more on the manufacturing floor. We want to be able to continue to, to work with you on helping you secure those environments in the form of cybersecurity solutions. And so today we're, we're going to be listening to a, a bit to, uh, to, to uh, uh, two experts in the field from uh, Daniel Lance with Clarity and Joe A.G. from, from Aqua Automation. Really what we want you to walk away with is that at the end of this uh, uh, presentation, we want to continue a discussion with you about your path to uh, security. You know, uh, we have locally trained engineers both in the Bay Area and the Fresno markets that can help with implementing some of the solutions you're going to see today and, and helping with the assessment. You know, what is the state of, of, of your network today and what are the vulnerabilities? And then the next point is really how can we then work with you to build a plan to, to, to remediate those, uh, uh, those uh, issues and, and, and build a much more secure network so that the, the network security does not become uh, a potential uh, uh, machine downtime issue for you and your plants. Uh, with that, uh, you'll be able to, to, to um, reach out to us uh, potentially through a, a post webinar survey that we'll have. Um, in addition to that, you can always reach out to your own account managers or, or network specialists uh, or proc specialists down in the Fresno or in the Bay Area markets. Uh, some emails, some general emails there from our sales at bucklesmith.com or my own email um, there that you can get in touch with me. Uh, but we definitely would love to, to make this webinar a first step in what your journey is towards a, a more secure environment on, on your manufacturing floor. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand uh, everything over to Daniel to, to take the next steps there. Again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. So I'm uh, Daniel Lance, uh, Solutions Engineer for Clarity. 
uh, have a little over a decade in uh, industrial cybersecurity and particularly in defense all the way down to you know, designing uh, you know, silica and PLCs. So uh, a lot of background there. Uh, I want to start out by thanking Buckle Smith for inviting us to speak here. Uh, we've, we've had uh, some really good conversations with them uh, very recently and they really understand uh, you know, the complexity of the problem uh, and the deployment of the solution, uh, both with certifying engineers and, uh, of course, working very closely with uh, with Rockwell on these matters. Um, so, you know, they've asked me to uh, kind of uh, talk about some of the things that, that we've spoken about uh, recently and in particularly what the challenges are in industrial cybersecurity. Uh, to head this off, uh, we can look at the landscape. Uh, we can look at uh, what we've seen happen over the last 10 years. We've seen a, a massive progression in the complexity of attacks uh, going into the industrial space. Uh, going back to 2010, a lot of people have probably heard about on the news or otherwise Stuxnet, of course, uh, which was uh, really just rocket science for a cybersecurity attack at the time. Uh, it was very, very unique uh, that we had an incident like that occur. And as we've uh, gone on, you know, five years from then, we had uh, the Ukraine uh, power attacks uh, where we actually saw uh, a cyber attack uh, utilized as a, a weapon of war. And uh, since then, the United States, uh, uh, in particularly, has gone out and uh, created the Cyber Command, and, and that's actually a, a group with the uh, express directive of cyber warfare. So they're actually an offensive arm. Where uh, previously, most uh, cybersecurity uh, techniques were were really designed and implemented for intelligence gathering. Uh, they weren't really uh, designed to to point to enemies. And, and so we've seen a, a massive change in evolution in the thinking around what is what is capable here. And uh, what's particularly notable uh, is the sophistication of attacks don't have to be nation state attacks, uh, particularly might have heard recently about a, a water facility uh, having a, uh, someone log in uh, remotely and, and change a couple of settings uh, that caused a, a pretty big scare. Uh, particularly uh, life safety systems are, are at risk here. Um, and it doesn't really take a, a nation state attacker. It takes someone that uh, understands the environment. Uh, we've even seen instances where uh, someone will have access to the network and will maybe have identified, uh, you know, even your network on something like Shodan and uh, figure out how to get access into that network. And then they'll actually sell that access to somebody else that understands the OT environment even better. And so security around uh, uh, security around these networks and defense of these networks uh, is is something that is uh, new and novel to uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so, you know, how is this different from traditional IT security? Well, traditional IT security, we were really able to build with a worthy adversary. Uh, meaning as attacks were coming out against routers and, and things of that nature, we were able to, you know, build firewalls and uh, mitigating controls as the attack landscape was ratcheting up. We're not able to do that in, uh, in OT. We're not able to do that in industrial uh, cybersecurity uh, in the same way that we had before, um, mostly because these control systems don't have the option for antivirus in the majority of cases. Uh, you know, there are technologies that were uh, designed in the uh, 70s, implemented in the 80s, and not a whole lot has really changed since then. Um, so diving into uh, what the uh, landscape is today, especially as we go forward into Industry 4.0, uh, we're actually seeing even more influx of IT technologies uh, that are helping us make, uh, you know, more sustainable products, uh, for example, uh, that are helping us with imaging and quality control. So I want to call attention to kind of the bottom bar here where we're, we're showing uh, operational technology going forward into Industry 4.0. And the scale that you're seeing here is, is uh, I feel, a pretty good uh, representation of how ownership and emotions are changing in these environments. And uh, we're having to collaborate a uh, significantly amount more than, than we ever have before. And we have to look at the landscape and figure out new tools and new defensive measures uh, to be successful. So 
what do we do about it? I know that was all a bunch of heavy stuff. I don't mean to scare anybody, um, but uh, that's that's kind of the world we're living in. Um, so here we have, um, you know, the situation and um, the requirements of the situation. Uh, again, uh, those those weapons that that might be used uh, in cyber warfare, they don't really know what direction they're pointing most of the time. <laughs> and so sometimes uh, even variants of uh, that old virus Stuxnet can can still be found uh, because the zero days are still applicable in some people's environment. So revealing what you have is essential. Being able to put it all on a list and uh, being able to call out exactly what you need to see to on that list is super, super powerful. And if it hasn't been something that your executives or C-class is asking you yet, uh, they're, they're going to be asking you pretty soon. Um, then moving forward to protect. Protect is where we're diving into all of the CVEs or, or common vulnerabilities that we're, that we're seeing uh, on systems. And, and we're taking everything from the InfoSec community and, and we're looking at that against your own environment. Again, you have to figure out what you have and then figure out how we're going to protect it. Uh, detect is is really where we're we're going into that pillar where we're we're really looking at the signals that are actually going across your network. We're we're using all of the intelligence of a of our platform uh, to dive into the signals that are that are shooting across your network, and and then we can draw some really sophisticated assumptions about uh, what is inside of those signals, uh, what they're doing, and give you actionable information. And this has to play as part of a, a larger role. So connect, we're, we're actually shipping that off uh, to industry leading uh, third party solutions that IT might already be running, that OT engineers might already be running. And so we're able to facilitate uh, massive numbers of integrations uh, with CTD. So a uh, little bit about uh, Clarity uh, as a company, um, you know, founded in 2015, 200 plus employees uh, now, um, investors, uh, you know, back in 2015, um, the whole market went out looking for solutions and very wise on uh, Rockwell's behalf that they, they saw the problem, recognized that they needed a vendor agnostic solution that could not only see and help uh, with, with uh, what was in their environments and their customers' environments, uh, but uh, there's inevitably a, a blow molder or something on the shop floor that is uh, only understood and contained by some other control systems. And so all of these companies went out looking for solutions and they all chose uh, Clarity at that time, uh, including Rockwell, Schneider, GM, BMW, um, and, and so they've, uh, they've stuck with us and gave us uh, really unbridled access to uh, build in and create a sophisticated solution that, that works alongside uh, your OT technologies in a, in a way that's really um, it, it's something you could anticipate, um, no sporadic anything here. So uh, we'll dive into that a little bit more in a, in a moment. Uh, since our, our founding, we've uh, done deployments in 50 plus countries. We've recognized 18 plus uh, verticals. Uh, we've seen a huge momentum in the, in the BMS market or building management system market. That's including uh, uh, data centers. You may not realize this today, but even just you know, popping open your phone and uh, <laughs> look, browsing a website or an application is eliciting tons and tons of industrial technologies. Uh, that can all have compound vulnerabilities uh, inside of them that may or may not be spoken for. So how do we take those pillars uh, that, that we need to uh, obtain some information about and, and how do we use our platform to, to see all this and uh, as part of a, a larger ecosystem of cybersecurity that you're gonna wanna lay into your organization? Well, here at the bottom, I'll, I'll call your attention to, to the bottom left where we have operational technologies. That's all your traditional technologies that, that we're used to running our shop floor. And all the way to the right, you have cloud services, industry 4.0, and, and we uh, kind of had this IoT thing sneak up on everyone when we were still focusing on feature-based computing in the 2000s. Uh, you, you saw a massive emergence of IoT devices that were due to market pressure, having uh, Ethernet stacks applied to them and, and many, many more uh, uh, devices that just simply can't have mitigating controls. So what we've uh, combined, uh, all of these devices under this uh, idea that the Clarity platform 
will give you visibility into the asset, will help you uh, manage vulnerabilities, detect threats, uh, and even uh, facilitate secure remote access uh, into the environments themselves. So uh, we've become the industry uh, leader in this space, uh, building out extensive integrations uh, with all of the uh, top IT tools, OT tools. Uh, and these are not only uh, partnerships, but also uh, technical integrations uh, that are fairly sophisticated, including uh, CrowdStrike here, where uh, CrowdStrike, we're, we're actually uh, sucking in some of their signatures and uh, spitting back out to them 20 plus years of vulnerability information where CrowdStrike is usually focusing on the, the latest and most cutting edge uh, threats to your IT environment. Uh, we now have the flexibility to actually uh, expose and show those, those OT relative vulnerabilities and how they could play in conjunction with, with those IT vulnerabilities. So how do, we, how do we do all this? <laughs> what is visibility to us? Well, a uh, deep protocol library. Uh, most of the protocols in the OT space are uh, unsecure, unencrypted. And so these uh, protocols uh, being native and being able to tear apart using our DPI engine, deep packet inspection engine, uh, all of uh, what's in those protocols and their payloads is super important. Having a team of researchers, we've elicited the help from uh, researchers from all around the world. We've acquired one of the best teams, I would say the best team uh, in, in industrial cybersecurity research. Uh, and our, our, our data definitely backs that up. Uh, we're, we're constantly uh, working with different certs, security certs, uh, to expose and uh, mitigate threats to the environment. Uh, and the broadest portfolio of capabilities, uh, we have all types of tools built into Clarity to play a part in that cohesive ecosystem of cybersecurity. And I, I think Joe's gonna to touch on that a little bit later here too. So how do we get all this information? I just wanna to touch on uh, architecture real quick. Uh, and again, uh, we can do this in a safe and sane way. Um, so here we are at uh, level three uh, where we have a CTD server and uh, we have a uh, layer three or core switch uh, that we're tied to here. And at that layer three uh, uh, core switch, uh, we want to see north, south, east, west traffic, uh, all the computer to computer uh, uh, communication going across it. We want to be able to passively ingest uh, all of that communication. And from there, we can do all of our jujitsu on the back end passively without having to actively interrogate devices. We do have an option to actively interrogate devices. We, we also have a, a parsing engine that'll tear apart all your Rockwell configuration files and uh, along with a myriad of other manufacturers configuration files. And uh, that allows us to, to get a level of visibility into the environment that's just really untouchable. Um, so without further ado, I wanna jump into the uh, uh, software platform here. Okay, so, so here on, on the platform, uh, this is the uh, dashboard that you'll first see whenever you uh, log into CTD, Continuous Threat Detection. Uh, here we have the uh, Threat Detection Overview, and this is uh, really speaking to uh, the detect uh, uh, column where we're looking at the signals, something that is relatively innocuous, uh, like a uh, IP config uh, uh, issue or IP conflict issue. Uh, you may not think very much about that, but we'll, we'll actually you know, notify you of it. Uh, if you're not concerned uh, that, that day, we'll, we'll save that. And we'll, we'll use that as part of a contributing uh, factor uh, if there was ever a attack against that device. Uh, here in uh, top alerted zones, these zones are actually built for you uh, automatically uh, by CTD. And so you can have a control zone for all your crown jewels uh, in the environment. Uh, you can work with uh, buckles to uh, identify uh, which devices exactly those are, uh, which devices operationally uh, need a higher level of consideration when third party contractors are connecting to them and what type of controls we wanna push over to our next generation firewall, which we also have integrations to. Um, completely optional, but definitely something that, that uh, we see a lot of people doing for micro segmentation. Uh, that might be something that you've heard recently. Here in risks and vulnerabilities, we have a hygiene score. This is a retrospective over time. We're taking into consideration all of the NVD national vulnerability database. We're taking into consideration uh, all of the uh, uh, CVE indicators, uh, both from a, a network level, operational level, and cybersecurity level. 
And as those uh, new indicators are coming out, when Rockwell sends you a, an email that, uh, that there, there might be a, a new firmware update, uh, then uh, you can come in here and, and figure out uh, whether or not uh, there's a CVE related to that new firmware update that, that, you should, uh, that you should be concerned about and any mitigation uh, that you need to do in the meantime and, until you have uh, an appropriate stopping point to go out and patch that PLC. Uh, top insights are totally dynamic. So this is only showing you exactly what you need to know, actionable information about your network. We do this at a per asset level, per network, per subnet, per enterprise. Um, and we're giving you the top concerns. And again, this is curated by the, our team in-house. And our team is made up of uh, defenders from all around the world, foreign and domestic militaries. Um, and uh, they, uh, they've they come to clarity uh, recognizing what our mission statement is, and that's to create safer, more reliable networks. Um, and, and we've uh, actually got our uh, DHS Safety Act Award uh, as, as a result of that. Uh, that's something also that, that uh, Buckle Smith can, can talk with you about after this. But um, visibility overview, and I want to go into this. Uh, we're going to kind of double click into visibility because this is a core concern that a lot of people have is what do I have in my environment? Well, again, we've, we've curated out all of the assets here, OT assets, IOT assets, uh, ghost devices or something that your assets are trying to talk to, but they never reply. And so we can we can really break this stuff down uh, in an easy to digest way that gives you actionable information. Here in the asset breakdown, we have again a breakdown of the technology types. Uh, we're breaking down all these zones, which are also customizable. Again, that's your your crown jewels in the network. You can apply different control wrappers around them. And going a, a step further here in the DNS queries, DNS queries is is great for being able to find data exfiltration. Um, you know, if you're if you're making a, some kind of a, a syrup or you know a medical manufacturing or otherwise, uh, you you might be in a scenario where there's some secret recipe that that you don't want anyone to know. And DNS exfiltration is uh, unfortunately all too common. Um, we can detect that here with our network analytics. We can look at the most prominent protocols, uh, what's outbound, inbound on our network. Uh, and then we're, we're going right down into the read and write executions on, on the uh, PLCs. So we can, we can actually see how often operators are going in and having to, to tweak different operations. And then we can also check for invalid uh, uh, entries into those operations. I want to dive into our assets here. This is that big magical list. So if you don't have a uh, CTD here, then you're going to be crawling around on the floor for uh, days trying to assemble this thing. Um, but I, I love showing this off uh, because this is a, our, our map view here where we're actually breaking out all the assets into a Purdue model level. And this is great because we're, we're first connecting to the network and we're building out all of the relationships between these assets. Who's talking to whom, who started the communication, and then we're building the baselines. That way we can move from training the system into protecting the system. And we wanna see the whole cyclic value of your network. So uh, I don't know what your manufacturing is, but if you make uh, you know, jeans on Monday and socks on Tuesday and hats on Wednesday, and then it starts over again, well, that's the cyclic value of your network. For some people that could be months and, and we have ways of handling that but this is a, a really powerful way to view your network troubleshoot your network and we can even view devices that aren't network connected uh, such as ups's and uh, remote io packs that we're able to parse out of those rockwell files so i'm going to dive in especially since rockwell's on the phone we're going to uh, we're going to pick on rockwell and we'll uh, we'll dive into one of their devices here um, so here we can see a profound understanding of PLCs. And that's what you have to have to start to protect, to start to have the conversation. Here we can see we have multiple IP stacks on this PLC. We're, we're smart enough to know that it's coming from the same device and compress that down into a single asset. Uh, we're able to pull out the firmware, the model number, uh, the serial number, and we're doing this all passively. This is on our default network. Uh, let's move forward to the device information because here things get really interesting. Um, you know, the PLC is like a stack of VHS tapes <laughs> and it has a key switch on the front of it a lot of times. Well, we're actually monitoring the state of those key switches uh, that, that are on the PLCs uh, because they can indicate whether or not a device is accessible. 
And additionally, we're, we're tearing apart what the backplane is of that device. We're able to do this passively. We're listening to the traffic as it goes across the wire using a span, a tap, a packet handler. And, and we're able to, to model out exactly what your environment looks like. And what you'll notice here is firmware versions, right? They're, they're all different. Well, these firmware uh, versions being all different uh, is, is okay because they probably replaced these cards in the middle of a break fix and they you know, didn't care to check the firmware. Well, a lot of times these cards are directly network accessible without transacting the CPU. And while that sounds all very technical, uh, what, it, what it really is is we, we need to be able to have something actionable that uncovers where those vulnerabilities are and how an attacker is going to move through our network. So here we, we actually give you a calculation of every single asset uh, here in our insights. And again, this is totally dynamic. So every single asset is going to have unique insights, um, ports and accessibility information that we can pull out. Here we can see a, a Rockwell proprietary database. We actually have that built in along with a whole myriad of other uh, databases that are, that are built in and proprietary from those manufacturers. Um, so here we can see that this, this one was, uh, was caught by Rockwell's database. Uh, so that's a threat that you would only know about if you, if you had access to that information. I wanna uh, touch on attack vector here. And attack vector is uh, really powerful. And this is something that as part of your security assessment, if, if you haven't already been asked this by, by your C-class, by your executives, you probably will soon. Um, and that's how is someone gonna get in? You know, I, I heard about the water attack. How is somebody gonna get into my network? You know, just if you can't tell me that, how much confidence do I have? Well, this is this is exactly how they're going to do it. Attack vector is is taking into account the vulnerabilities uh, of the network. Here we can see a, another unique uh, database, a uh, 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 ICSA, uh, and then here we can see a SSA. So that's actually from a different manufacturer. I believe that uh, happens to be Siemens there that has that vulnerability. And uh, here we have a remote networking uh, connection out to uh, this level six, which happens to be the internet in this case. So, you know, we're literally living in a world today where you can go download a uh, operating system, a Kali Linux or what have you off the internet. That's what all the hackers use. And, uh, and if you know the right combination of buttons to plug in, they're going to be able to get access down and into this environment. So very scary stuff. So how do we tell a story with this? Uh, in, in a scenario where we're uh, running uh, continuously on the network, we'll be building out uh, these stories and looking for uh, things like configuration changes. We're looking for out of hours. Somebody reprograms a PLC at five o'clock on a Friday. Uh, well, <laughs> we're gonna be letting you know uh, that you need to go have a talk with Ted or Joe or whoever. <laughs> so, uh, so here we can see our, in our uh, risk score, we give you plain English readout, you know, very, very simple uh, to be able to read this out. We can see uh, what the indicator uh, exactly is. We get a root cause analysis of everything that was implicated uh, in this particular event. And uh, here in the event details, we can see that uh, we had, you know, seven plus events uh, that we correlated into the story about these assets and what was happening with these assets. Here we can see uh, the configurations of the PLCs. So we can actually uh, show you uh, what, uh, what was happening on these, on these PLCs, what configuration changes, what exact line of code was changed. Uh, and then you can assign this to someone uh, to go out and, and run an investigation against it. So really, really powerful stuff. Uh, from, a, from a DNS level, we already talked a little bit about uh, uh, being able to see exfiltration, but uh, again, going back to our original example here of Stuxnet, well, Stuxnet was uh, spinning and underspinning uh, uh, centrifuges to uh, enrich uh, uranium, and, and they're blowing up these centrifuges all the time. And, uh, and that actually uh, had an impact on, on customers that uh, uh, were not enriching uranium <laughs> that just happened to, uh, happened to be running S7s. Uh, the, the PLC in question. Well, this is how we detect uh, threats that don't have known signatures. Nobody has ever seen it before. And so uh, what we can see here is uh, everything that happens on the rail of the PLC. So if you have 
a uh, uh, pressure sensor that normally reads five PSI to 15 PSI, and it goes up to 15,000 PSI. Well, that's an anomaly that we're gonna make you uh, aware of. Uh, additionally, going into network sessions, being able to uh, pull apart uh, operational problems in this investigation, maybe you have a, a retransmit that is really, really high on a particular asset. It could be a, it could be a bad cable. It could be a, a corroded connector. Uh, it could also be a, an SMB device that no longer exists and the controller is just constantly going out and trying to talk to it. Uh, which could also be exposing itself to some cybersecurity uh, concerns. So if you don't have the data, then, then you can't really ask these questions. And as part of a, a larger ecosystem here, our risk assessment report in uh, security posture assessments is vital. This is, this is uh, the 900 pound gorilla. This is what everybody, everybody talks about whenever they talk clarity because uh, it just gives you every single piece of actionable intelligence that we've been able to collect from the tool. Uh, and additionally, we're able to ship uh, all of these deltas off to your SIM. Uh, we're able to ship them off to third-party integrations, next generation firewalls, uh, CrowdStrike, CMBD ticketing systems. Uh, so we, we have a ton of versatility to get this information off the platform and make it actionable. And to talk more about that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Joe, I believe, uh, from Rockwell to, uh, to kind of wrap up as, as to uh, how they see this being used in a larger security picture. Fantastic. Well, Daniel, it was a great presentation. I wish I'd have got to go first because that's going to be a tough one to follow, but I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Joe Agee. I work for Rockwell Automation. I'm a business development lead for our network and security services team. And um, today's webinar has been focused on, uh, on Clarity's uh, continuous threat detection solution. Um, as well as a cybersecurity posture survey, but I want to focus on the broader cybersecurity solution. I want to start by reviewing the, the threat landscape for ICS security, and it's changing rapidly. And Daniel touched on a few of those things, and I'll I'll touch on some additional ones as well. Uh, as as he talked about, we know about Stuxnet and the Ukrainian power grid, and clearly with attacks like Ukraine, without a, a remarkable response, some red lines in the sand have been crossed, as he talked about. Um, cybersecurity being more of a, a, a weapon uh, nowadays. But nation states aren't the only threat actors these days. Um, terrorists can buy or rent the skills, infrastructure, and tools to launch effective attacks now. Cyber criminals can use ransomware to hold our production hostage. Uh, a recent article talked about ransomware for hire, creating custom ransomware campaigns to target a single organization with significant downtime costs might be more willing to pay a ransom. Uh, cyber criminals are increasingly selling their services and skills, code and toolkits, and even some open source malware, which can be repurposed. Activists seek to do damage to entities they don't like using previously mentioned resources. And insiders, as Daniel talked about with the, uh, with the hack at the water facility in Florida uh, about a month ago, uh, remain a pervasive risk um, as witnessed uh, in another incident in Georgia Pacific where an employee um, uh, committed an ICS attack on a plant he previously worked at. Uh, WannaCry Not Petcha proved that even threats not specifically targeting ICS can have a significant impact on industrial networks and the, and the weapons grade malware uh, is available for less sophisticated act actors to, to, to use. The sky's not falling, but the risk equation has changed recently and industrial asset owners and operators are starting to pay attention. Um, Daniel talked about the two Ukrainian incidents in 2015 and 2016, which directly targeted electrical generation assets and included ICS protocols and knowledge. Um, WannaCry was more general attack, but had impacts on ICS. Um, as you can see from the slide, that the, the number of attacks are increasing uh, year over year. Uh, in, 2017, in 2017, things changed dramatically uh, when NotPetya got out in the wild. Um, a couple of years previous to that, the NSA had been hacked uh, and a lot of their cyber weapons uh, got released out to hackers to purchase. Uh, and actually, the NotPetya used some of that technology. I'm actually reading a, an article about that right now, or a book, 
Um, so there, there, there's a group called GRU in Russia, and that's sort of their uh, cyber uh, attack group, if you will. And they're the ones that carried out the attack on the Ukraine power grid in 15 and 16 and shut down electricity to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the dead of winter because there's been conflict between Russia uh, and Ukraine. Um, in 2017, uh, they wanted to launch an attack, but they wanted to focus it on Ukraine, but much more broadly. Um, so the, the idea they came up with was, well, there's a, there's a small software company in Ukraine that's basically Ukraine TurboTax for Ukrainians. So they came up with this brilliant idea that if they could put the payload on the update server of this small software company, they would just attack Ukraine and nobody else. But what they didn't think about was it was a multinational company that has an office in Ukraine. It could spread outside of Ukraine, and that's exactly what happened. Um, as you can see here, cyber uh, attacks cost real money. And these are just some self-documented statistics by, about some of the big companies in 2017 that got hit by NotPetya. Uh, Merck, $870 million, uh, TNT Express, $400 million, St. Gobain, $384 million. And this book I'm reading uh, talks about Maersk, which is the world's largest container shipping company. Um, and just to give you an idea of how fast something like this can spread within a matter of minutes it got outside of their ukrainian office spread throughout their entire network and and and, and remember that it was ransomware but the 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 gru never anticipated giving anybody the code to unlock the files so it spread through Maersk in a matter of minutes and at the end of the day it took out over forty nine thousand pcs and four thousand servers so you think about that. Now you don't know what containers are on ships and you don't know what containers are on trucks waiting to come into, port, uh, into the, the, the docks uh, to get put on ships. So they were shut down for weeks. One thing that saved them was they had a backup domain controller in a third world country that had power problems and it happened to be shut down when, when the, the attack happened. But it still took them weeks and months. They had to fly IT people in from all over the world inside of their company, as well as IT folks that were could be spared by their customers because they had so much work to do. And the other thing is, you think about logistically, you can't call up Dell and say, hey, I need 50,000 PCs and 4,000 server boxes, and could you deliver them overnight? So, so these threats are, are, are real. Uh, in cybersecurity, there's a saying that there is no silver bullet that can protect your organization, but it's a series of solutions that work together in a defense and depth strategy. Therefore, I'm going to talk about the broader cybersecurity landscape uh, in, in, the, in the next few minutes uh, that I have here today. As a level set, this slide shows the industry standards bodies that define industry best practices in regard to overall uh, cybersecurity posture. There's a common thread between all uh, these cybersecurity organizations, as you can see, concept of defense in depth, segmentation, and the proper establishment of an IDMZ. I want to point out here that if you want to implement any type of cybersecurity continuous threat detection solution, it is one component of an overall cybersecurity program that includes well-designed network infrastructure, the use of an IDMZ, and the use of defense in depth principles that I'll highlight here in a, in a future slide. Uh, this is the Purdue reference model. Uh, it's laid out in levels zero through five on the left, corresponding to the Purdue reference model, as well as security zones on the right as defined by global standards organizations such as IEC, NIST, and, and ICS CERT. Ensure everyone understands the terminology I'm using when you hear me refer to IT versus OT. I'm referring to the enterprise security zone or IT uh, versus the industrial security zone or OT shown on the right hand side of the slide. If you'll remember from the previous slide, we talked about defense in depth segmentation and the use of an IDMZ. And as you can see here, IDMZ is shown as that boundary between IT security zone and OT security zone. And the purpose of the IDMZ is to provide secure communications between the two security zones by inspecting the traffic entering and exiting the IDMZ. It also acts as a logical disconnect point in case there's a cyber incident in either zone and it can also buffer information in case of a disconnect uh, to enable you to continue to run the plant uh, for some period of time. When we talk about segmentation, we're referring to both segmentation between IT and OT, OT, 
but also the use of uh, with with the use of an IDMZ, but also micro segmentation at the cell area level in the OT zone for the purpose of creating broadcast security and fault domains. An example of defense in depth mechanisms, uh, I'll show you here in, in a future slide. Um, let me build this out. So, so Rockwell created an alliance partnership with Cisco back in, in the mid 2000s, and, and the purpose was to provide customers with design guidance. Uh, we're doing joint product development uh, as well as education. And from that partnership, we've developed tested, validated, and documented reference architectures that, that address several implement, implementation scenarios, such as converge plant-wide ethernet, uh, deploying industrial firewalls, physical infrastructure, REP, uh, wireless for real-time control, NAT, uh, identity and mobility services, securely traversing the IDMZ, resiliency, migrating legacy networks, site-to-site -site VPN, deploying an IDC, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, deploying DLR, uh, scalable time distribution, cloud connectivity, OEM networking, uh, network security. So there's, there's about 18 or 20 different design guides that are available to you if, if you wanna try to self-help. Um, but we use all of those tested and validated uh, designs uh, in the work that NSS does that I'll uh, mention here in just a minute. And then uh, we talked uh, earlier about um, the concept of defense in depth. And this slide shows all the different areas where defense in depth can be applied across the OT network. The concept of defense in depth actually comes from the military. Uh, the intent is to provide layers of defense knowing you can't stop an attacker but through layered defenses, you can slow the attacker down in order to give you time to stop them before they can, for example, cause physical damage, steal intellectual property, et cetera. And then uh, lastly, and, and, and I really like this slide, and this, this is part of our, our uh, clarity presentation. Um, I like this slide because it illustrates what network and security services team at Rockwell, which is, is who I represent, can provide to our customers. Uh, but also illustrates how all of the services that we can provide customers play a role in that overall cybersecurity solution that, that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, I'll start on the left-hand side of the slide under build a foundation. So NSS or Network and Security Services can provide network assessments uh, as well as comprehensive network designs. And the purpose of a network assessment is to evaluate an existing network infrastructure against industry best practices and provide remediation advice on how to bring the current network up to industry best practices. And the comprehensive network design provides a detailed logical and physical modern network design architecture uh, for customers. In regard to deploy, manage, and monitor the infrastructure, uh, NSS can do a complete turnkey network implementation of both the physical and logical network infrastructure that comes out of that network design and then once the network has been installed, uh, we can also offer a 24 by 7, 365 remote monitoring and administration service where we provide an industry leading 10 minute service level agreement in response to any critical alarms. And our average response time is actually three minutes. And this is critical to minimizing downtime in an OT environment. And as Daniel was talking about, you know, as more contemporary technologies get introduced more rapidly, a lot of times customers just don't have the personnel with the skill set. Uh, so a remote monitoring service like I just talked about can help supplement or augment your existing staff. Plus, we provide 24 by 7 by 365 monitoring administration. Excuse me for a second. I'm going to take a slug of water. Next is our pre-engineered data center product or IDC. Our IDC is a tested and validated hyperconverged virtualized compute environment, uh, complete with all the compute storage and switching to support your OT applications. Industry best practices says you don't want to combine IT resources and OT resources, both compute and network infrastructure. So the, the IDC is really meant to address uh, OT applications. Also, the IDC is built to an N plus one redundancy, so no single failure will bring the compute environment down, and obviously that's important. And industrial manufacturing, because if we're not making parts, we're not making money. Um, you, you simply supply us with the workloads or the applications you need to run in your OT environment. We size the IDC, 
assemble it off site and ship it to your facility and send a smart guy in to stand it up. We also offer that same remote monitoring service for the IDC that we do the network. And a lot of times people go, well, you may be asking yourself, how does an IDC help with my cybersecurity posture? By housing all your applications in one place and by taking advantage of things like thin client technology, you can greatly reduce your attack surface in your facility because you're not having to maintain you know, a bunch of white boxes to where I got to worry about patching the OS and I got to worry about antivirus and things like that. Uh, this webinar has been focused on the Clarity Continuous Threat Detection product. And NSS is partnered with Clarity to deliver turnkey implementation services for their CTD solution. Uh, we've got implementations all around the world. Uh, I saw an announcement this morning, actually, that Rockwell Automation was voted a global partner for Clarity Award uh, for 2020. Uh, in addition to implementing CTD, we also offer a monthly tuning service for CTD. Daniel didn't really talk much about that. That's to ensure only the most valuable and pertinent information is being presented to the end customers to ensure you don't suffer from alert fatigue due to nuisance alerts. And then uh, later this year, we'll also be offering a remote monitoring service to, to respond to customer alerts in real time, again, on a 24 by 7 by 365 basis. This is basically a industrial security operations center uh, is what we'll be standing up uh, based on some acquisitions we've made over the last year or so. In addition to the Clarity CTD solution, we also implement their secure remote access solution, uh, which Daniel uh, briefly mentioned in his presentation. And then we mentioned the IDMZ earlier, and NSS can provide IDMZ design and implementation services, uh, as well as remote monitoring administration for the IDMZ. And then lastly, we also offer patch management services uh, to patch known vulnerabilities within your industrial control system environment. And I think that is all I had. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I think I came in on time and uh, I think that leaves us exactly. a few minutes for uh, questions. I uh, just want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy day to join us today. And I um, also want to give a huge thanks to all of our presenters uh, for sharing all their awesome content. Um, we really hope you find this, imp this impactful and hope to host you again at one of our future webinars. So uh, if there's any other questions, we'll sign off and hope you guys have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.